Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to today's distinguished lecture presented by the Center for Multilingual and Intercultural Communication at Stony Brook University. My name is Agnes He, I'm the director of the center. Uh, it is great to see everybody, and I'm particularly happy to see some students from our language and cultural classes in the audience. Uh, language learning and teaching has often been considered a practice heavy and theory weak. And in our practice, we have often focused on materials, methods, tests, and student performance. We have not really paid enough attention to the social, historical, political context and ramifications uh, of language studies. And neither have we paid enough attention to language learners' perspectives, positionings, and identities. So our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Danping Wang, is going trying to uh, change this. <laughs> Dr. Wang is senior lecturer and program leader in Chinese at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, where she is the recipient of the Teaching Excellence Award in 2014, and the Early Career Research Excellence Award in 2020. She has also been invited by the New Zealand Ministry of Education to serve on the subject expert group to review the assessment standards for Mandarin Chinese. She's currently leading a project supported by the Royal Society of New Zealand to explore new theoretical directions for Chinese language education through a decolonial perspective in New Zealand, which in the Maori language is known as Aotearoa. Did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> the title of Dr. Wang's talk today is Translanguaging as a Decolonizing Approach, Students' Perspectives Towards Integrating Indigenous Epistemology into Asian Language Teaching. So, Please help me in welcoming Dr. Wong. Thank you, Professor Hu. Uh, I will just share my PowerPoint. Um, Tina Koto Katua, greetings to you all from Auckland. I'm deeply honored to speak at the Distinguished Lecture Series. And I want to thank all the organizers from Stony Brook University. Thank you so much for getting everything ready for me and for my talk today. Um, the topic of my presentation uh, is translanguaging as a decolonizing approach, students' perspectives towards translanguaging, uh, towards integrating indigenous epistemology into Asian language teaching. The topic is based on uh, a new, a very exciting and extremely rewarding project that I conducted in my own Chinese language course. Um, based on this project, I wrote an article which will soon be published uh, in the Applied Linguistics Review. As we can see from the title of this talk, there are several keywords that may require some background knowledge to understand. So when I started working on this project, I felt overwhelmed. Um, there is so much to learn and so much to unlearn. So at the very beginning of my talk, I wanted to say that I may not have all the answers to your questions, and even including the questions I, I asked in my own project, but I will do my best to share with you what I have done so far. And I also look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, about what we are doing in New Zealand and also exploring opportunities for uh, research collaborations in the future. Okay, so now please allow me to provide some background information about this study. Let's start by looking at some statistics. China has become New Zealand's largest trading partner since 2017, overtaking Australia and the United States. As you can see from the di um, this diagram on the top provided by the New Zealand China Council, the trade flows between China and New Zealand have shown significant growth in the past 10 years. Um, New Zealand's a typical trade uh, dependent economy. Well, in language education, it is believed that trade volumes 
play a driving force in determining which language to offer in national education, you know, with regard to training the future workforce for the national interest. So about 10 years ago, um, a renowned scholar in language policy and planning, Professor Joseph Lobianko, predicted that the Chinese language will assume the status of second or third foreign language, and in some, some Anglophone settings, as the first foreign language. However, <laughs> more than a decade has passed, Chinese um, remains a medium-sized language program. In this much anticipated Chinese century, as can be seen in the chart below here. Although um, the past decade has seen has indeed seen a sudden surge of Chinese language learning in New Zealand, actually for the first time in history. So today it is still much smaller than French, Japanese and Spanish. So by comparing these two charts, we can perhaps come up with two observations. One, the choice of which language to teach in schools is not necessarily governed by the operation of marketplaces. And second, language learning in secondary schools has declined. In fact, according to New Zealand uh, Ministry of Education, the percentage of secondary school language learners is now at its lowest since 1933, we are even worse than before the Second World War. So while if you um, want to find more about why Chinese remains a medium-sized language in the two Anglophone countries in the Asia Pacific, I'd be very pleased to share the article I co-authored with uh, Dr. Alice Chick from Macquarie University. The, doc, uh, the editor of our chapter is uh, Professor Xiao Lang, Kurt Christensen. Uh, we appreciate her valuable suggestions for our article. In fact, the worrying decline of language learning has been observed in all Anglophone countries. In 2021, an edited volume was published by a group of foreign language educators and researchers. It is called Language Learning in Anglophone Countries, Challenges, Practice, uh, Practices, and Way Forward. In this book, they argue that the global success of English has led to language learning crisis in Anglophone countries. So both in, school context, in the school context and in higher education. They believe that the complex combinations of liberalization, decentralization, and marketization, and in some Anglophone countries, the rising nationalism, and all of this contribute to a gradual but steady co <coughs> excuse me, uh, erosion of language learning in recent decades. So although language learning, uh, the language learning crisis vary from country to country, some commonalities can be found as the causes of the erosion of language learning. The authors of the book called them four linguistic uh, myopias, which are ignoring existing plurilingual competencies. Uh, for example, the very popular immersion approach, um, that it rejects students' linguistic repertoires. So the underlying logic behind the target-only language ideology is actually a colonial mindset. Um, second, essentializing English first language learners as incompetent in language learning. So their lack of motivation and perseverance is not because of their weak willpower, it is because the globalization of English has left them with very limited opportunities to improve their social status. Just simply by learning a foreign language, it's very different from what we did uh, when we were young. So we learned English and we changed our life. It's, it's not really the case for a lot of the English uh, native speakers. Um, so the third point, ignoring the disadvantages conditions of English first language learners. Um, for example, not all of them are from the upper class with the social resources for them to excel in language learning, or all of them have the time out of their degrees to study a foreign language. So we just can't take for granted that everyone's, you know, super interested in learning a foreign language. And last one, laying the problem at the door of individual schools or institutions. 
So without the policy and government support, you know, for foreign language learning, many language programs have been closed and positions were disestablished and teachers just lost their jobs. So many of these um, concerns and um, have been picked up and examined in this edited volume I highly recommend. It's called Decolonizing Foreign Language Education, <clears throat> the Mismatching of English, uh, Misteaching of English and Other Colonial Languages. So many leading applied linguists have contributed to this book. Their chapters have shown that the problem with the decline of foreign language learning lies in uh, the colonial matrix of power, which controls not only the resources, but also our ways of thinking and knowing things. So for example, in chapter two, Claire Crouch <coughs> argued, in the English speaking world, learning a foreign language has remained an elite uh, occupation. It has been so intent on meeting the needs of students in a globalized world, but has not paid enough attention to the colonial attitudes it continues to convey, you know, from this nationalistic past to its current global orientation. Kremsch said, it's time to decolonize foreign language education and reinstate the learning and teaching of foreign languages for bringing about peace, trust, and mutual understanding, rather than all about enhancing one's, one's status among the national elites for gaining a competitive edge in the global market. So I feel strongly about her call to rethink the goal of foreign language education. So in my Chinese language program, I have stopped telling students that you, you can find a better job if you study a foreign language, you know, especially Chinese. But instead, I tell them, you know, studying a foreign language will challenge how you see the world. It will disrupt the knowledge systems you are familiar and comfortable with. And more importantly, it will make you a more humble and a respectful um, person to other people and other cultures. So one question is particularly important today for all foreign language educators, researchers, and teachers to carefully think about what should be the ultimate goal of foreign language education? Can our work make the world a better place? So I started uh, seriously thinking about these questions back in, in 2019. So shortly after I took my first Maori language class, which is the common language uh, used by the indigenous Maori people in New Zealand, I was deeply impressed and honestly kind of shocked by how the Maori language is taught. It's exactly, um, you know, the way as I was trained not to do. <laughs> so um, I think pretty much I, I share the feelings uh, how Alison Phipps experienced in her Maori class while she uh, was visiting New Zealand a couple of years ago. She described her Maori learning experience in her recent book, Decolonizing Multilingualism. So please allow me to quote a few lines here. Um, Alison said, we started on a journey uh, which began first and foremost by decolonizing my own cosmology and my largely communicative intercultural competency based the theories and practice of language pedagogy. This is what we uh, are trained to do. But in the Maori class, she said, that pedagogy would not involve me, you know, busy taking notes or writing down the words, but it's completely according to uh, the indigenous ways of teaching a language. So <clears throat> the teachers and students all just sit together, they talk about who they are, their families and where their ancestors are from, and then they spend time on building relationships um, with each other. And also the, uh, the learning content is closely focused on relationship. So it's, it's not only about um, building the connection and relationship um, with um, the, the language learning content, but also with the nature, with our past. So nobody's uh, offended by the question, where are you from? So everybody's talking about where they're from. So it's, it's not really 
it's always a sensitive question uh, in, in the language classroom or in the social encounters. So my experience in the Maoli class is very similar to Alison's. It was a critical moment for me to realize that non-Western ways of teaching can also exist as a legitimate and effective approach. And, and most importantly, it touched my heart. So Alison's book has greatly influenced my research and my thinking. Decolonizing foreign language teaching needs collective wisdom and cannot be done by the indigenous communities alone. So Alison said, it requires people who are able to embark on such a journey and return with tales to tell of what happens when decolonizing is attempted in foreign language learning. So I had the opportunity to, to embark on this journey and I am now back in town to tell the stories. So now the story begins. First of all, I'd like to provide you with some um, useful demographic and historical background information about New Zealand. As everyone knows, New Zealand is a faraway island, it's here <laughs> in the South Pacific area. The country is slightly bigger than the UK uh, in terms of land area. However, in terms of population, it is a very small country. According to the most recent census, New Zealand has about just 5 million people and about 70% are white. Um, and Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, represented 16.5% of the total population, which is the second largest ethnic group in New Zealand. So modern New Zealand was founded based on uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. It is widely accepted as a constitutional document that establishes and guides the relationship between the Crown in New Zealand, uh, which is embodied by the government and the Maori people. It was signed on the 6th February uh, 1840 at Waitangi in the Bay of Islands. So quite coincidentally, as soon as I finish this talk, I will be on my way to the Bay of Islands to attend a four-day staff development program at Waitangi, where, where we will be learning uh, more about New Zealand history and also to explore how to decolonize our teaching and research. Um, and since 1980s, um, numerous language revitalization in initiatives have been implemented um, in Maori merchant schools in New Zealand. And in 1987, the Maori language gained recognition as one of New Zealand's official language, uh, official languages. Another one is the sign language. The social status of Maori language has greatly improved uh, over the past four decades. So following its successful attempt to slow the decline of the Maori language, the New Zealand government has introduced a new educational initiative to acknowledge the equal status of traditional Maori knowledge in the mainstream education system. So in 2019, the government launched a series of major changes to the National Certificate of Educational Achievement, which is called NCEA, which is the official secondary school qualifications for uh, years 11 to 13 in New Zealand. Uh, and since 2020, I was appointed by the New, Ze uh, New Zealand Ministry of Education as a special expert group member to work with secondary school teachers in Asian languages, uh, including Chinese, Japanese and Korean, to develop new course outlines, assessment instructions and sample test materials to be used from 2024 onwards. Among the seven key recommended changes here, as we see in this image, the second one is believed to be a breakthrough in the Eurocentric Western educational system in New Zealand. This is called Mana Olite or Mote Mautaranga Maori, meaning giving equal status to Mautaranga Maori on par with mainstream Western knowledge in the NCEA. Mautaranga Maori, it's a Maori word, 
it can be interpreted as traditional Maori knowledge for the indigenous people of New Zealand to express their uh, ways of thinking and being and living. I will give you a few examples later. Um, the goal for this educational change is to ensure Mount Taranga Maoli is actively valued and resourced in NCEA, um, broadening access to Mount Taranga Maoli pathways and increasing teacher capacity to understand what is, um, what is uh, Maoli knowledge and what Maoli culture and also help students to understand it for the exam. For many teachers, as you can think about it, integrating Mautaranga Maoli is not as simple as adopting a new textbook or a new pedagogy. It would, it would require them to attend professional developments so that they can help students unpack the Maoli concepts to be used in their NCEA exams. So now I would like to draw your attention to how this word is used here. It is used directly in English without providing a translation. In recent years, more and more Maori words like Mautaran and Maori have entered New Zealand society. There is a, a, an interesting story here. Um, when I first started working in New Zealand, uh, I spent my first few weeks wondering what's wrong with my English. So I didn't know. <laughs> That were those words, uh, you know, used in the emails and documents were Maori at that time. I thought they were English. <laughs> so the Maori ways of knowing are fundamentally different from Western ways of knowing. So unlike Western thought, which is based on uh, what we call ontological primacy, which means uh, the objects can exist independently. So Maori ways of knowing are based on relationships. We exist only in relation to someone or something, and our existence is meaningless in the absence of others. So according to Maori epistemology, language learning should not be limited to studying the language structure, grammar rules, and vocabulary, nor should it be limited to achieving proficiency levels um, to use the language simply just for instrumentalist purposes. Instead, we should consider what kind of relationship we should and can build with people who speak this language, as well as how we can continue to develop our, um, the improve our relationship with them. So when Malta Ranga Maori is integrated into NCEA, it is no longer an indigenous concept for the indigenous community. It will become an equally important knowledge system in the national education system. It is not only a means to understand the indigenous community's worldviews, but also a system of values and, and beliefs fundamental to New Zealand's national identity as history and culture. So what do you see here in this word cloud are some frequently used Maori concepts. Um, I, will choose, I will choose one of them to give you an example. The word I choose is whanongatanga which means family-like relationship. It refers to a relationship built and maintained through shared experiences. It develops as a result of kinship rights and obligations and extends to a close familial friendship or reciprocal relationship. So in the new NCA, Maori concepts such as whanongatanga will be used as guiding principles for students to prepare for their assessment. For example, what you see here, I just I made some uh, screenshots from the NCEA websites. These are the two uh, speaking activities that students will need to do for their level one NCEA examination. So in fact, um, Mautarana Maori has already been integrated as an innovative framework by many government sectors, such as for mental health uh, purpose, for uh, social work and early childhood education. New Zealand's most reputable uh, research founding organization, um, the Royal Society, has been very dedicated to promoting the equal status of Mautarana Maori in research grants applications. So in 2019, I was awarded a master and found 
by the Royal Society of New Zealand to investigate how to reconceptualize Chinese language learning using uh, the Maori epistemologies as an innovative framework. Uh, I was very fortunate to work on this project with Professor Patricia Duff. Uh, I think she is here uh, listening to, to my talk today. It's, it's very honored. But quite unfortunately, the project has been disrupted and delayed by the COVID lockdowns in the past two and a half years. Uh, so we will we will resume the project uh, this year, and hopefully, you know, Patricia will be in New Zealand for a, a big conference. I will see her soon. Uh, in New Zealand, yes, <laughs> all government-funded research projects must take Vision Mautaranga into account. So Vision Mautaranga is a New Zealand government policy framework that aims to unlock uh, the science and innovation uh, potential of Maori knowledge and resources and people uh, in their research. At present, I think New Zealand is perhaps the only English speaking country that requires all its research organizations and researchers to, co to consider and also to include uh, indigenous school of thought in the research education and policy making. In my university, a new strategic plan was just published to guide a major curriculum transformation program in the university. So the goal of the curriculum transformation is to demonstrate you know, the university uh, is committed to uh, promoting Mautaranga Maori and the Treaty of Waitangi principles and accountabilities. So in teaching and research, we are expected to reflect the value of Maori knowledge and ways of knowing and the re relationality on, uh, of the Treaty of Waitangi. So according to the university's strategic plan, um, as a knowledge institution, we have the responsibility and honor to develop, nourish, and protect the Maori-led revitalization of Mautaranga. So as a result of this uh, curriculum framework trans transformation project, we now need to upgrade our professional knowledge, uh, adopt new approaches, and learn new epistemologies in our teaching and research. So one big concept I adopted and in introduced into my teaching is translanguaging. Now I would like to turn to the theoretical framework of this study. What I'm showing you here is a photo of a ceremony where students of Chinese get together to read a language pledge before they board on a plane to study abroad in China. I'm sure many American colleagues have already recognized this photo. You probably even know who they are in this photo. So the total immersion approach implemented in programs like this one has become a predominant teaching approach in Chinese language programs. Numerous Chinese immersion programs have emerged across geographical locations and educational levels that are very, very successful and impactful. So teachers' pedagogies are based on classical second language theories like uh, Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis, Michael Long's interaction hypothesis, and Muriel Wine's output hypothesis. And these theories have combined to form a solid theoretical foundation for monolingualism to take root in second language teaching and become the norm and uh, at times the only acceptable ways of teaching a language. So as a result, Many educators, teachers, and researchers who advocate the immersion approach believe that, you know, teaching in a non-target language does not contribute to the teaching of that language. But many, uh, you know, scholars believe that um, monolingualism is one of the major reasons why foreign language education declined. So in the past few years, Translanguaging has become a very powerful and liberating theory that challenges the monolingual bias in language teaching and learning. So translanguaging, it's a process of using one's full linguistic repertoire to gain knowledge, to make sense, and to articulate one's thought. So many people find it very hard to grasp the meaning of translanguaging compared to other uh, new theories just introduced to the field. It is because translanguaging is not following 
the structuralist, uh, structuralist binary reviews of human languages as a theoretical tool, translanguaging empowers teachers and students to question the logic of the dominant order that maintains static, um, static, binary, and instrumentalist view of language and knowledge by abandoning the traditional view of first language and second language as contradictory entities. So based on the notion of translanguaging, um, the boundaries between named languages do not exist. Instead, we see knowledge and knowing, language and languaging as a relational and entangled process. So no matter how many languages we know, and regardless of at what levels, all linguistic resources should be viewed as maybe messy, but a whole repertoire and inextricably linked to each other. And the knowledge systems carried by these languages also should be viewed as, um, you know, exist equally in our life experiences. And they should be given the equal status in our life experiences as well. So not to use a new language and a new knowledge to, to replace the old ones. So in short, translanguaging theory ask us to develop a holistic view, not only of our linguistic resources, but also um, of our knowledge systems. So that is to say, translanguaging is a decolonizing approach to language teaching and learning. It gives equal status to one's all linguistic resources, whether it is first language or second language. So when we learn a second language, the first language that's, does not have to be wiped out from our memories and life experience. In recent years, um, translanguaging has attracted a lot of research attention and has become very popular theory in second, second language education research. So how, however, as Li Wei and Ophelia Glatzia as new article pointed out, there have been misunderstandings about the notion of translanguaging everywhere. So in terms of the um, classroom conversation transcripts that we produced in, in our research, translanguaging appears to be like just the same like code switching between named languages, which are uh, uh, in fact, uh, the named languages are socially and politically uh, constructed concepts. They, as a matter of fact, um, uh, do not exist. However, this, this trans means transcendence of named languages, is to break the boundaries of the named languages and to view one's entire linguistic resources, um, including first language, second language, as one holistic repertoire. So the title of their article is not a first language, but one repertoire. And uh, Li Wen and, and uh, Ophelia Glatzia argued that in this article, translanguaging is not simply about using students' first languages. It's a decolonizing project that seeks to challenge the abyssal thinking where social reality is classified on either this side or the other side of the abyssal line. So Western knowledge is positioned as truth on this side of the basal line, while any epistemologies that do not meet Western standards are banished to the other side where they are reduced to false knowledge and becoming merely uh, like a personal opinion or beliefs. So consequently, uh, Western epistemologies become the sole source of knowledge and are thus positioned as universal. And so this, this one language only policy is to utilize, to maintain the universality of Western uh, knowledge. However, translanguaging calls for breaking the boundaries and opening spaces for all possibilities and also opportunities to restore pluriversality in education and in our lives. So, in my role as a language teacher and a course developer, uh, when I have all of these big concepts and uh, the cause for me to change my minds and the major transfer, uh, curriculum transformation programs all coming to me, um, the, I think I am first interested 
in finding out how my students uh, would perceive uh, the changes and especially the curriculum transformation to integrate Maoli epistemology through translanguaging in their in their learning of the language that I teach. So um, because of the limited time I have today, I prefer not to go into the details of the methodologies of my research paper. Um, the paper sh should be published online within the next couple of weeks, but I would like to give you some um, very brief introduction of it. And then I'm going to show you uh, some examples of what um, I've been doing with uh, the theoretical framework and also uh, with the concept that I just introduced to you. So the aim of the study is to answer three research questions. What are students' perspectives towards, first, translanguaging, second, embedding indigenous word views in an additional language course, and third, how is translanguaging enacted in an assessment that embeds indigenous epistemologies? So I conducted this research in, my uh, in the first semester this year, which is from uh, March to June, with my uh, year one Chinese language course at the University of Auckland. All students are complete beginners of Chinese in this course. So about um, 83 or 84 percent of the student group, uh, there are students aged between 17 and 21, the very young students. And they, uh, we have a slightly more female students than male students. And the two major student groups in this, in this course were Asian and Europeans. And only about just 3% of students identify themselves as Maori. Um, so this, this, you know, <laughs> despite this diverse ethnic backgrounds, um, nearly 75% of the students reported speaking English as their first language. So let's have a look at their um, the survey results. The survey questions were developed based on a focus group interview with a group of students before all students were invited to take the survey. So there are about there are 10 questions in three parts to understand their prior knowledge of Maori language and culture and their attitudes towards integrating the indigenous uh, epistemologies and their attitudes towards translanguaging. So a total of 155 valid questionnaires were returned by the students in this course. So the survey results show that most students found they were familiar with the basic Maori words and culture, though uh, many acknowledged that they could not speak Maori language for communication purposes. Secondly, most students embraced the idea of integrating indigenous, uh, indigenous knowledge into this course, and they found that integrating Maori concepts had transformed the course to be more locally relevant and respected. Students tended to believe um, the use of Maori language and culture had increased the authenticity of the course for its efforts to revitalize indigenous uh, language and cultures in New Zealand. And, and uh, students' perspectives regarding uh, the intersection of Chinese and Maori uh, cultures were neutral. It's because that many students would say, I don't know why, how this could help me learn the Chinese language to gain the proficiency. So because students are trained all the way um, through their uh, schooling that uh, having a good grades, uh, learn the skills are the most important thing for them to do. So we, while we are having this major transformation in the courses, we probably also need to include students into the training so that everybody can be open-minded at the same time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Um, lastly, the results revealed that um, students were positive about translanguaging. It is mainly because language use uh, involving both Maori and English has become an ordinary practice in their school lives uh, before they uh, come to the university. The course had um, some international students, um, but their first year university study has um, already prepared them to embrace translanguaging as an acceptable and locally meaningful language practice on campus. 
so we don't see a lot of problems from um, them. Now let's have a look at the case I reported in my research paper. So my research is based on uh, uh, a speaking assessment that is designed based on uh, Maori epistemology uh, for Nongatanga. It is a 20% speaking test, um, but this test was used to be done by asking students to uh, memorize the new words and grammar rules in the textbook and make a self-introduction either in my office or uh, in the classroom. That was pretty scary for students who just started learning a foreign language and also kind of boring for teachers to listen to so many similar and perhaps fake self-introductions. So why can't we just allow students to be who they are and to speak what they want? even you know, at the beginning of their language learning journey. They don't have to you know, make up stories about themselves, about their families. They can just be who they are. And why don't we just, you know, why do we have to cut off the relationships between their past and their new life experiences? So on Canvas, um, this is our uh, learning management system. I explained to students that this assessment will be different. We will be incorporating uh, Malta and Maori, um, the Fanongatanga, as the guiding principle for this assessment. So I explained to students uh, what is Malta, uh, what is um, this uh, Fanongatanga, and there is a word here. It's called, uh, uh, for example, we we can have a look at the green. Uh, shaded uh, the section here. So this activity draws on the Maori concept of whanongatanga. Whanongatanga is about family or fano. Fano is the Maori word for family. Um, but, but usually in New Zealand, we don't say family, uh, even though we speak English, we prefer to just use fano to represent a family because it has more, uh, it, it includes more information than the English word family. So um, it's about funnel sharing knowledge, resources, and life milestones with each other. And it's also about, you know, we, we through funnel, our family, we learn to establish connections with the world. And also through this, we bring the world back to our funnel by sharing our experiences with them. So the concept of Fanongatanga and Fano are central to both Chinese and Maori cultures. Um, what about your culture? So ask the students. So in this vlog, you are expected to show Fanongatanga with your Fano. So this is the in instruction I give to them. And then introduce the Mihi and Pipiha as an activity familiar to local students. Mihi and Pipiha, pipiha means self-introduction. Mihi is for non-Maori people, and pipiha is for Maori people to do. I don't use the English word self-introduction in this um, on Canvas because Maori ways of self-introduction involves more than telling other people who they are. The textbook we use is uh, Integrated Chinese Book One, which is very popular in the in the states as well, and it's written by uh, American uh, uh, scholars. The speaking test was based on the first two lessons of the textbook, which are about self-introduction and family. So the students' video projects are based on what they learned in their first six weeks in the course. So for if, if you are familiar with Chinese language teaching, you probably know, you know, in five, six weeks, students probably can't learn much, but I'm going to show you how students can do within just six weeks of learning. Um, I'll show you. The assessment title is Video Project One, My PPH, uh, My Mihi, uh, slash PPH, and My Funnel. So as you can see, it's translanguaging here. A funnel means family. It is more frequently used um, directly um, in New Zealand. And the in this description of the assessment, I, I I don't think I have I, I need to explain what FANO is. So students just read uh, Mihi and Pipiha and they understand a lot of the Maori words in the description. So the type of assessment is called digital um, multimodal composition, which is a very popular research area. And students' videos are their digital products. 
And the students are the creators who use all the resources they have to make a meaningful digital product to tell uh, about themselves and tell their stories. And I also explained that in this um, uh, introduction of the assessment that this Chinese video project uh, in this in this project, they are welcome to use English or Maori or any languages they find important and meaningful to their stories and their identities. So I used um, Padlet to demonstrate all students' video projects. It was just amazing to see so many wonderful video projects. Uh, you know, as a teacher, I've been grading, marking students' works for a long time. And this is, to be honest, this is really the first time I can honestly say I enjoyed marking. <laughs> so I know a lot of students have, you know, watched uh, all other students' uh, video projects. And some of them even became very, very good friends after the class. So this is kind of a relationship that we can build in the course. I would like to show you just one um, video project. I've obtained a student's consent to use the video. Her name is Ella Lam, and I'm sure you will be impressed by what she can do in just six weeks of learning. Whoa, ciao, Peter. Whoa, ciao, Andrea. Hey, ho, watch out, Anthony. Hey, ho, watch out, Jefferson. Tom and Shi, Cincy, London, or Baba, or Shi, Cheese Way. For Mama was a For Baba did gong to CEO. For Mama she jotting shufu. Jefferson a she was sway. Anthony a she si sway. For her she sway. For men she so young the hazer. For men bo she since London. Jefferson and Anthony she they live in rain. For she jungle rain. Jefferson did gong to she li sway. Anthony did gong so she jiao shou jia. Wo shi ao ku lan da sui li sui shong. Ju shi wo jia di di jiao bian. Wo men si miao xian. Wo men si huan li xin. Wo men si huan ji fan. Something memorable about my family is that we are all of different ethnicities. We value and love each other. We are made to be together. Ah, yi hao. <laughs> Ni hao. Sorry. So this is this is amazing. It's because the, the parents and siblings. Uh, are involved, not only just showing up in their videos, but also have learned Chinese with the students and made an effort to speak the language in the video. So they supported each other. And language learning is no longer a lonely journey. It is a shared experience in the family and where everyone learns and grows together. So this is just one example of how uh, indigenous epistemology can transform language instruction and assessment. So um, I also got some um, students' comments uh, after they finish uh, doing their project. I'll just, you know, for the time being, I'll just read one of them. Uh, for example, this one, I really enjoyed creating this assignment, assessment, uh, assignment and it challenged me to think in new ways as it was very different to what I used to do at uni. I loved being able to explore the relationship between Chinese and Maori culture and my home culture being Turkish and Kiwi. I found that there are many similarities be, uh, between Turkish, Chinese and Maori culture when it comes to important, the importance of family and food. 
So it was awesome to be able to bring this to my mihi and being able to integrate my personal life into my studies by introducing uh, my funnel in this project was very, really meaningful. So coming to the conclusion, I would just uh, wanted to say, I perhaps have offered a very novel insight uh, for additional language teaching in a settler colonial country by using a decolonial uh, perspective to explore alternative conceptualization uh, that can enable a, a pluriverse, uh, pluriversal uh, epistemology stance in language teaching. Um, it is my hope that this study can extend uh, the fields of language teaching in terms of considering how translanguaging corresponds to decoloniality for a more effective transformative uh, and a transformative change in our practice. And future research perhaps can continue to explore the ways to promote active student learning through indigenous scholarship, not only the indigenous uh, knowledge and culture in New Zealand, but many, many other places, and also, you know, place-based um, epistemologies and knowledge would be uh, important as well. So um, at the practical level, um, I think this the findings from the research is also important to, uh, you know, we should include practitioners, researchers, and, and administrators, cu curriculum developers, and a classroom, you know, activity designers in um, this decolonial attempts. And finally, I, I must say, in many aspects, uh, this research and this decolonial attempts may seem contestable uh, in regard to our competency-driven language teaching practices. So, but. This is starting point, I think, for many people uh, interested in uh, learning and using uh, pluriversal uh, word views in our teaching and wanted to make a difference, make a change in foreign language education. So I hope this research initiates discussions, reflections, and even critiques among colleagues in additional language teaching on our you know, taken for granted educational goals. So the research paper I just presented is one of the articles in a special issue. It is, uh, its title is Translanguaging Outside the Center, Outside the, the Global North and Outside the English Language Teaching. The case of uh, uh, perspectives from Chinese language teaching. I'm the guest editor of this special issue. Uh, I think we'll probably organize an online forum to share our research papers with anyone interested in translanguaging, you know, uh, using translanguaging to make a change in uh, in Asian language teaching and uh, and other language teaching, you know, outside the the center. So finally, I think I will use a Maori proverb uh, to conclude my talk. Uh, my strength is not as an individual, but as collective. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Professor Hu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some time for questions and comments. Um, okay, well, maybe I'll get I'll I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll get things started. Uh, this is a very timely topic, as I explained. You know, we are in the process of looking at uh, intercultural uh, dimensions of language learning. I mean, through our ongoing research project funded by the Department of Education in the U.S., uh, we are also looking at focusing on language and social justice issues in the, in the, particularly in the last few years. So your talk is very important and very timely. Uh, well, I think some of the things that you said uh, agree very much with our ongoing research project. For example, you said, well, students are learning languages and then whether they are learning or not learning have less and less to do with the job market. People mm. are no longer oriented towards uh, employment opportunities. And this is what we found through our large scale uh, student survey as well in Asian languages across Chinese, Korean and Japanese. Very few students actually say, I, I, I'm learning the language so that I can get a better job. It is more, I think, the 
focus is not on personal growth, the expansion of identity options. So that, you know, we have this empirical finding that would corroborate with what you're saying here. Um, and very recently, we had a speaker uh, in our uh, series, um, uh, Angela Scarino, who was mm -hmm. talking about the interculturality of learning. So not necessarily trying to be the so-called target native speaker, but rather to develop this kind of intercultural uh, self-reflection and a growth and taking into the societal and linguistic ecologies you know, as we learn. So we, we I find a lot of uh, resonating themes in your talk. Um, I also have some questions. So I appreciate the fact that you are drawing upon the epistemology of the Maori. And uh, so when I first uh, you know, came uh, come across with this material, I'm originally, I'm instantly thinking about the, the Chinese cultural and a cognitive epistemology, right? So if a focus on relationship, that is the very first theme of Confucianism, Lun, Lun relations, mm -hmm. precisely verbatim as you, as you put it, our existence, the individual is meaningless, you know, when we're decontextualized from the people who which we're relate with which with whom we're related to, right? So I wondered whether in your uh, practice, your pedagogy, and and in your thinking, are you also implementing the epistemologies, the traditional epistemologies of the people who speak the language which you are teaching, as well? So that is the first question. Perhaps you might want to say something on this before. Yeah, and I also want to give other people a chance to, to talk. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's a, a, a very interesting question. And I, I think, you know, at some point, it's a bit tricky to answer in the New Zealand context. Um, because for a lot of reasons, you know, people see this uh, government change, uh, they see this as a political correctness. So they do not really want it to take a further step to think about how to make connection with the other minority communities. So what about their epistemology and their cultures? And even in the language that we teach, I think the primary focus should be on how to use Chinese philosophies, Chinese school of thoughts as an innovative framework. Um, but the, the problem is um, for a long time in an Anglophone country like New Zealand, we don't really have any space for any cultures except for um, the, the white culture and, and Western knowledge to even have a crack in the knowledge system. So as they just as they explained uh, using um, the metaphor called a beastal line, so we are on the other side. So this is only a kind of an opportunity for the first time that a non-Western knowledge, a non-Western uh, uh, epistemology had an opportunity to be seen and to be promoted by the government and to introduce it to the national education uh, system. So I think we are kind of being smart here because we can use this as a chance to at the same time introduce the Chinese philosophy into this framework because we're not calling it just Maoli framework. We want it to kind of using the research we are doing to give the government some new ideas how to implement a pluriversal framework rather than just a multi and maoli led framework so that other cultures and other knowledge systems can can be um, you know regarded as an equal uh, player in the national uh, education system so uh, when it comes to as as what you just said we have a lot of similarities between the indigenous culture and Chinese culture because um, I think some research shows that the Polynesian people actually migrated from Asia to New Zealand. So uh, back in the, the, the old days, there are a lot of uh, principles about family, about ancestors and how we see the nature and the superpowers pretty much similar. And also in modern 
days, they the Maori culture has a word called ako, uh, a k o. It means um, to teach and to learn at the same time. So this is a, this is a concept that many Chinese people can easily understand because we have a word in Lun Yu called so you teach and you learn so teaching and learning will need to happen at the same time so for for chinese people you know a, a couple of weeks ago i had a, a professional development i gave a, a, some workshops to secondary school teachers so we talked about this and the school teachers can always give me examples about you know the similarities between Maori culture and Chinese culture, Maori philosophy and Chinese philosophy, and Maori ways of doing and Chinese ways of doing is is remarkable because nobody is giving them this this ways of thinking, looking at the similarities. They can they can just feel it. They can just come up with uh, their observations about uh, what they can do by combining the Maori ways of teaching and the Chinese ways of teaching in their classrooms. So this is pretty much at the, the, the pra at the practical level that teachers exploring, but at the policy level, I don't think the government would say this is a decolonizing project they are doing. So we, uh, in all the documents, we have never seen any word mentioning decolonization. It's only that we use a theory, we use a framework, tr uh, trying to understand what the government is doing. And also they wouldn't say, you know, um, community uh, knowledge and other cultures are appreciated in the national education system. That's that's would be too far for the government to acknowledge that. But at the practical level, I think this is something as educators can do. Um, I, I hope, you know, um, there will be more discussions about this and more research can come up so that we can expand the discussion to other communities. Um, rather than just seeing this as uh, a matter just between the colonizer and, and the Maori people. Well, I have a lot more to follow on, but I want to give every <laughs> other people a chance first. Sure. <laughs> No, it's hands up. Well, okay, I'll start in. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. Very stimulating. I'm here in, as you know, but maybe others don't know, I'm here in Vancouver, uh, Canada. We have one of the, actually the largest Chinese language program in North America. And this indigenizing the curriculum has been um, a big uh, initi initiative that the Chinese um program has been undertaking together with other language programs uh, across the Asian studies and European languages and so on. And not only indigenizing, but also trying to um, make the curriculum more inclusive of diverse kinds of backgrounds, whether gender, identity, sexual sexuality, or other kinds of, um, of, of categories. And, and on that point, um, so has Hong In Tao at UCLA with the University of California consortium been really trying, not the indigenizing, but the making more inclusive the teaching of Chinese um, across the UC system and beyond. But so, so I see some really interesting synergies here. I just wanted to say that it's quite interesting that on the one hand, well, um, um, centering Fanau, Fanau, uh, mm. Uh, as the, the family in the curriculum and in the early lessons, while that's going on to um, embrace the Maori uh, traditions and sensibilities, we, we here, at least in British Columbia, have been told to not talk too much about family because it's very sensitive for people. And in K through 12, you can't ask people to describe their families because it's just so fraught and they're embarrassed to say about their families. And so I just, I find this very interesting. It's coming to the fore and yet in some other contexts, it's considered um, difficult knowledge for, for many people and to be avoided. So some of these uh, contradictions or tensions, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking to you more about it in New Zealand. <laughs> sure, Patsy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Patsy, for your insight. Uh, Hello, do, do you mind me addressing very briefly to pass these questions or, or just mentioning of the funnel? So I had a, this 
you know, concern when I was developing uh, the, the platform for students to demonstrate their video projects. And in the very beginning, I thought maybe I'll just ask students to send their videos individually to me. And then I had a a chat with students at my office hours. So some students turned up and they said, why do we have to do that? And why do we have to be um, treating our family just as a privacy? Because from, from the video I just showed everybody, the student uh, was adopted and she is not you know, ashamed of her family backgrounds and not ashamed of, you know, everyone's having a different, uh, you know, ethnicity in her family. So, so why should we uh, be so consider, you know, telling other people about our family as being a sensitive issue? So if you know, if students are having the information that this is going to be on a public forum, but this is only uh, restricted to the, the students in this course, it's not uh, published to the whole world. So if they know this is a safe environment and the students, um, they are just their classmates. So there's a, from a small funnel to a bigger funnel. So everybody's a funnel as long as they are, uh, they, they know that they are going to be treated equally and they're going to protect each other in this environment. And then there's no problem. And also just going back to what I just said uh, about where are you from, this question, I know there's a, a lot of you know, discussions and, and talks about it and feeling, um, you know, this, this is a kind of another question that we can no longer say and no longer ask each other. And I think back in the the the, the context that I introduced, uh, so what's really the problem that we are offended by other people asking where are we from? So our ancestors, our legacies, our backgrounds, our heritage, should, we should first of all not feeling ashamed of it ourselves, even though we migrated to other parts of the world. And we cannot deny that we used to be, you know, with, with our families who's from a, a very humble background. And this is nothing to be ashamed of. No students are ashamed of who they are. Uh, when I was uh, marking their assessment, I don't see anyone's having an embarrassing face or they don't want to share. Everybody wants to share. So yeah, I, I don't know what's wrong with, with our problem. We're getting more and more restricted about the topics we can say and, and, and uh, relationships we can build. Thank yeah. you. That's my Eric, feeling. Uh, Erico, my colleague, Professor Erico, has a question. Hi, Erico. Hi, hi, Dr. Wang. Thank Hello. you very much for a very interesting talk about the yeah. future of our teaching, foreign language teaching. And I can see that um, teachers learn from students, students learn from teachers, students learn from peers. So learning from each other, but I guess that there are so many things that come in, that are discovered for the first time through this teaching environment. Very, uh, very interesting, and I am really I really appreciate. And I have a question, very practical question. Mm -hmm. uh, your video assignment is um, very exciting and very enjo enjoyable for creating and for viewing, and how uh, would you uh, assess? What are the, for example, uh, criteria when you yeah. assess these assignments? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think assessment is always uh, something that would, you know, make the the fine part not so fun <laughs> in teaching. <laughs> so. Um, students would know how are we going to, they are going to be assessed. So the, the marking rubric, uh, it's also uh, published on Canvas. So students know they will be assessed, uh, first of all, on the design of this project. So if it, it needs to be something that people would find it um, easy to follow. And there's a story in that. It's a good video. It's a good story. And then we ask them to have uh, sufficient content to include in the video. They have to, they need to speak enough Chinese so that we can assess their, their learning. They should provide evidence in it. And then their pronunciation and their use of uh, the grammar structure and the vocabulary. So as a matter of fact, we have reduced the uh, ass assessment on students' structural knowledge to just 20, uh, 25%. So 
you know, before this big uh, assessment is given to students, I will have a workshop and uh, I will explain to students what they are expected to do, just step by step, how to use Padlet, how to um, you make the recordings and how to get consent from your families. You need to tell, first of, for example, your mom is going to be part of your project. You need to at, at least let her know you are filming her. <laughs> So you don't want to see your mom wearing pajamas in the kitchen making breakfast and then you suddenly had her in your video and then your whole class is watching it. So I will include some part of the, um, the preparation for them to do the projects. Um, yes, so I think we'll need to continue to develop the marking rubrics. I think for assessing a video project, uh, no matter what the content it's about, it's really a, a new topic, uh, especially in the field of um, digital multimodal composition, because we are not seeing this as a piece of writing uh, from students, but also as their product. So you can't really, you know, mark it according to, uh, you know, whether they're accurate or fluent uh, about using the language. So you need to think about what kind of message they have included. And also some students are pretty concerned about uh, uh, their tech, uh, their, you know, tech skills. And uh, we do need to take that into consideration because everybody says our students are uh, uh, digital navies or natives and uh, the tech savvy. But when it comes to uh, education comes to learning uh, for serious projects, uh, they are not really as uh, smart or as uh, <laughs> proficient as we thought. They're probably very good at playing games, but not really at making uh, a school uh, assessment like this one. Yes, we are happy to share the marking rubrics if you're interested. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very much big concern for us too, but your project, video project, in, uh, make students engage with their families. So we can see the process aspect too. So I thought it's very exciting. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jamping. Well, I think we have another question from Dewey. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Dewey. Hello. <laughs> I'm Yui. I'm from Vietnam. Um, and my English is not good, but I'm interested in translating. So uh, today I have um, maybe two questions that I want to ask you. I'm the beginner of doing the research question. So um, the first question I want to ask you that is the what is the difference um, between um, um, you already um, um, Translation is a pedagogical uh, approach. So, what is the difference between uh, translation and grammar translation method? The, the first question and the second one, um, L1, um, L1 seems to be uh, forbidden in our um, classrooms in Vietnam. So, um, how to defend? Um, we can use um, translation in the classroom. So, uh, sorry, uh, if um, my question is not good, uh, please forgive me. <laughs> no problem. Just just happy to okay. address the questions you have. It's just I think it's a it's it's just precisely as I said when I was using uh, Li Wei uh, and uh, Ophelia Glacius paper as an example uh, to show that. Uh, people have a lot of uh, misunderstandings about the concept of translanguaging, because when we we can see from the research papers, it's about using this language and that language at the same time. But this is just at the superficial level of understanding translanguaging, because this concept, first of all, requires us to see to see the languages that we know in a very different way. Because, for example, I give you a, a very um, um, interesting um, an analogy here. Do you do laundry, do we, at home? 
do you do laundry? If you do laundry, you will probably know that before you do laundry, all your socks, uh, clothes, and wear, they, they, they are together in the messy state. And after you do laundry, you take them out from the dryer and you start to fold them, socks here and uh, pants here. So this is a process that we, we are socializing. We are trying to uh, discipline our laundry into different box. So winter socks here, long socks here, black socks here. So we give them a, a boundary so that socks for different purposes would stay in different uh, categories. But this is what we did uh, with our languages. So uh, when it comes to, you know, the when we use the language in the classroom, we can see, for example, you, you mentioned grammar translation. This is a pedagogical approach that we mainly just use students' first language to address a, a, a learning content, a learning area. But this is not about really, um, you know, the one who is doing the trans, uh, the grammar translation already has this, you know, boundary breaking concept in his or her mind. We are pretty much still seeing um, the the shared language between teacher and students is valued, but not necessarily we see all the languages can be, you know, messily, um, you know, you know, mixed in our brain when we use the language. So there's a still a huge way to go from the, the uh, whether this is grammar translation or text-based language learning, the pedagogies that we used to know to the today that we use translanguaging to see our languages and see our teaching approaches. So when you wanted to incorporate uh, translanguaging in your classroom teaching, the first thing you need to do is not really to, to tell students and teachers, hey, let's just use your first language. Whoever has the, you know, has the language that is not the target language, just speak it. This is not really what uh, we are advocating here. Um, although I think this is already a very progressive movement that teachers can acknowledge that your students are speaking many, many different languages. But this is not to say in every language classroom, we're going to ask everybody to, uh, to use the time to express their identities all the time. But I think the, the goal for the teachers to do is to tell students, don't be ashamed of using your first language. Don't be ashamed of who you are, because no matter what languages you speak, when you are learning this one, it, it's going to make you a better person. It's going to give you more language in your already rich uh, linguistic repertoire. So it's going to give you more opportunities rather than, you know, just use the, the new language you learn to replace the old ones. So there is a hierarchy between the new language and the old language the student speaks. So... Yeah, I think primarily, I think if you implement uh, translanguaging as approach in your classroom, we need to change our minds before we take any actions. So there will be a lot of things that teachers need to talk with the students, what they are going to do. And this is very much to me, I think it's a, it's a philosophical stance that you need to declare uh, with your students, you know, before you just tell them, hey, let's do a new teaching approach. But this is not really just, just a new teaching approach. Um, so I hope I have um, answered uh, just maybe part of your questions here. Uh, thank, thank you. Let's, thank you uh, let's take one more. Let's take one more question. Is that okay with you? Oh, perfect. Okay. Why you go ahead? Uh, hi. Hi. Why you very, very hi. informative and also timely uh, topic uh, as we be actually talking about how to make the language classroom more inclusively, right? And I actually, uh, it's more than, it's, uh, it's not just, uh, not a question, but more uh, of a comment uh, about uh, actually the uh, Professor Duff talks about the, the, the family issue. This actually, this, the introducing your family members and what uh, they do, uh, it's probably uh, the first a uh, couple of lessons in all of the Chinese textbooks, right? Yes. And that's exactly the similarities between the Maori epistemology and also the Chinese culture about 
what can be seen as private things uh, in your life and what can be shared with others. Even when you first meet others, like uh, for the first time or the second time, you, know, you don't, you're not really familiar with others as, uh, as uh, friends yet. And you can actually ask this kind, this kind of questions. So I actually, uh, I just finished the grading of uh, this topic that because we are just teaching the family in the Chinese language classroom <laughs> and uh, we had the discussion about how they view privacy, what can be seen as um, the inappropriate question to ask and um, what uh, if they were asking about these questions um, using Chinese, uh, would they feel uh, offensive or how would, how would they deal with these kind of situations? So I really liked the student's reflection and I really liked the videos uh, you shared the, uh, in, the, in the presentation as well. I think that makes the very close link between the Chinese uh, uh, Chinese culture and also the, the, the culture that we taught as a target language and also the Mori epistemology, right? So these kind of similarities, I think will really bring the students, uh, not just the language, but reflectively thinking about uh, what they do and what they want to do uh, using the language. So that's just my comment on that. Yeah. Thank you, Wang Yi. I just I wanted to add just a few words. When I first started teaching, I I I thought about this and why Chinese people are so obsessed uh, with talking about their families. Why family is so important in this teaching and learning. You know, in this this uh, when somebody is designing a textbook. And in 2020, uh, six, uh, 2016, I published a paper. You know, I analyzed uh, some textbooks. Uh, and just precisely as what you said, almost all Chinese textbooks will have family as one of the uh, the most important lessons in maybe just uh, lesson one, lesson two, or lesson three. Within the three lessons of a new textbook, you must be able to say a topic about family. So we're going to introduce kinship terms, you know, because we have a very developed system uh, for fam like the family trees. And in English, it's not a, it's kind of underdeveloped. So for for uncle and uh, auntie, you probably can have you know refer to your whole family, but this is not really the case for for Chinese. So we need to teach them. And then for a long time, I felt you know the Chinese ways of teaching is um, is behind English uh, ways of teaching, is not modern enough because we are still talking about families. Hey, come on, how about we talk about something cool, something fun? And, you know, the, it started to change, you know, uh, after a couple of years uh, in New Zealand. And I find, you know, why, since when, you know, family is, is, is a topic that we sometimes would find it uh, very sensitive to talk about in the formal education settings. What are we... Uh, offense you know what are we offended about um if this is a part of the life that we wanted to reject um this is not really who we are so we are still trying to disconnect from who we are today with who we were yesterday so this is this this continuation in our identity has resulted in a lot of problems you know the mental health issues and the social problems um, but in, in education, and especially in, in Chinese language teaching, we're probably, you know, when we talk about decolonization, I think it's one, one question is very big and it's very important is um, why and since when we have this Western approach and Western ways of teaching and the content that English language teaching always focused on and our Chinese ways of teaching, why are this is like, you know, the, the, the Western way is always modern, it's always scientific, and it's always the correct way to do and the correct content to include. And since when we are not confident about what we need to teach, what we can teach, and we what we want to teach uh, in a language, uh, you know, in language education. And when we develop our curriculum, we always wanted to refer to how English textbooks are doing, what are their interesting topics, but we are not looking at, 
you know, inward, what we, what is indigenous to the Chinese culture and the Chinese ways of being for this, this long time. And we are not confident even uh, in teaching, deciding uh, what content we wanted to teach. So I think this, this Maori ways of teaching and the training I had in New Zealand has given me some confidence you know, by observing how the indigenous communities, their struggles and their, their efforts of showing, you know, showing to the government that their tradition, their legacy, their history, and their people, they are important. They can't be uh, you know, changed according to the Western ways, your preferred ways of living and thinking. So I truly admire, uh, you know, their efforts and they, uh, the, you know, the the contribution they made. And that's why I, I said in my in my research paper, this is not only about indigenous group of people. They uh, they wanted to correct, re, uh, redress the history, the wrongs in the past. I think we all need to play a role in it. And we also need to see the opportunities, you know, the, for decolonizing foreign language teaching and, and what kind of role we can play in it. And to make, not, not only to say, make the world more equitable or inclusive, but also, you know, in, in terms of how we think about the knowledge system, we can produce knowledge. Even though we are Asian language education, we can still produce, something that is um shared can be shared by many cultures you know the we don't ask we are not trying to emulate the universal ways of teaching but we wanted to promote a pluriversal everybody can um, play a role in in this uh, practice of foreign language teaching so i think it, it eventually you know this is this is the kind of um, equality or equity that we we are really hoping to achieve. It's it's not only about uh, becoming, uh, <laughs> you know, learn how to teach like other people uh, are doing with their languages. Thank uh, you very so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. Um, I'm a conscious, mindful of the fact that you have other obligations today. And so thank you so much for spending an hour and a half with us and with a very engaging presentation, very thoughtful comments and remarks. And I, I know that our conversation will continue. Uh, so today's lecture is has been recorded and will be shared with all the participants today. And we will, with Dr. Wang's permission, we will post the recording on our center's website as well. So I would like to thank our speaker again, and also thank everyone who came to join us today. Thank you very much. We hope to see you in our future Distinguished lecture Lectures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ho. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>